I, I am I am I am sure you have questions. I'm sure you have comments. I and I hope they're like bubbling up. What I'm going to do is ask you to hang on to those. Um, a reminder: we actually have a long session at the end of today, which is saying, okay, how are we going to bring this together? What are we going to do tomorrow? And so it's going to be, you know, to continue to be thinking about what happened in your session, what did you hear in the other sessions, where are the synergies between those? Hang on to those questions um, because what we're going to do now. Um, it, before we go to lunch, as as we do in in you know in, in react, reflecting the the survey responses and what we learned in the the first phase of this project is that assessment is important and it's a challenge and so we're really fortunate to have um, two speakers today who are going to um, conduct a session to focus on assessment. Barbara Bogue is the director of SWEES, the Society of Women in Engineering's program, um, the AWE, the AWE project, the Assessing Women and Men in Engineering. She's an associate professor of engineering science and mechanics and women in engineering at Penn State University at State College. And Betty Shanahan um, is former executive director and CEO of the Society of Women Engineers. Um, she's currently a consultant based in Chicago. And so I'm, we're going to turn this over to Barbara and Betty um, to help us with assessment. Okay. And this is our advancer. Hello. Try and get try and get this working. I don't know. Do we have so, a clicker? That is a clicker. Oh, okay. I'm an electrical engineer too, so this is always really embarrassing. <laughs> okay. So can everyone hear? Both of us? Okay. I'll try not to do what they do in Singing in the Rain, which is the <laughs> going back and forth. Okay, so uh, Barbara and I are really pleased to be here today. And I, I think, first of all, because we're very passionate about this topic. But secondly, I think we're a great example of the kind of successful collaboration that, we're, that, we, that you're talking about. Um, as was noted, I was the executive director uh, with SWE when Barbara first came up with the idea of partnering. She was on faculty at Penn State running the Women in Engineering program. And together, using an approach very similar to what we're talking about, we created the kind of successful collaboration that really made a difference. Um, our different networks, our different perspectives uh, really added some strength there. And with uh, the AWE project, we included uh, uh, specific uh, grants that brought in Nesby, Ship, and ACES. Uh, she brought in a number of behavioral scientists and social scientists on the academic side. So I think we are bringing to you uh, proof that these kind of collaborations are valuable. Now, good work, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> now, in, uh, I'd like to uh, start by making, well, we're going to start by making the case uh, for effective uh, assessment-based framework for doing the collaborations. But I'd like to start with one challenge to all of you because we're very fortunate to be speaking to the leaders of the engineering societies and leaders of academic institutions. Change management tells us that change does not happen without leadership driving it. You are the ones that are going to make change happen. It's not going to be your volunteers. So please take that to heart. And as someone who was in the role of being a society leader, I know it's not easy when you're saying to your volunteers, you're going to have to do more work. Or maybe we've got some bad news here and we need to respond to the bad news. It is challenging, but our mission as society, engineering societies, missions as outreach programs and academic institutions is not to create fun for volunteers. It's to have effective outreach. And we're going to be talking a lot about that. Um, and so when it, one of the things you can see just to outline it, we'll be talking about, you know, what are the roadblocks? Why is it hard to do? Why is it everyone knows we should do it? Why don't we do it? And how can we do it? And then one of our pitches is that really applying good engineering practice a good engineering outreach practice so that we 
too often people come in to do the engineering outreach and don't do things you would automatically do in industry as, as a way of planning. And then we'll also talk briefly about available resources. So what do we mean by an assessment-based framework? Oops. Um, basically, this is a framework that would work in you pretty much... One. Oh, I missed one. I'm sorry, I skipped yours. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> she lives in Chicago. I live in Alexandria, so we're, we're working this out. So what do we mean by this? Really, just exactly what we said. The assessment-based um, framework is really taking engineering practice and applying it to outreach. And so we're looking at a framework of assessment, which includes identifying the audience, identifying the goal and objectives, and also identifying how we're actually going to measure those and how you use the data afterwards. And these may be things you've seen before, but, but we really are going to try and drive home a couple points during it, during this presentation. And maybe one of the, the first points in this presentation is this kind of framework works in a lot of different scenarios. So this framework can work for your collaboration, if you're collaborating among engineering societies or between engineering societies and academic institutions. Uh, it works for your own society when within an individual society you're developing the outreach program. The important thing is that you just ensure goals are, are met, you identify goals, you build in the measurement so that you can actually uh, measure the impact of achieving those goals and continually improve. The only difference between applying this framework when you're at the, uh, looking at collaboration or looking at the society level is where the goals are coming from, ensuring in a collaboration the goal of each partner is met versus in the society or your mission and the goals from, from the individual society. So we're going to start out with a story, and this is a story for a long-running program that's, that's continued to improve. Um, it's a story of a residential camp that we try, decided to try out at um, Penn State. And this camp um, was a great idea. I mean, we, we looked at the research, we said interdisciplinary thing, and we were trying to attract um, having more girls come into engineering. So how do we do that? We looked at interdisciplinary because we knew from the research that this is a more appealing area to girls. You also know it by how many girls are going into that as opposed to AFE or, or electrical engineering or mechanical or even now computer, sadly. Um, so the other thing we wanted to do is identify kids who didn't want to be engineers. And we did that by pitching to the parents. <coughs> so the parents were forcing their kids to come. And, you know, that was a challenge for us, but it did mean that we get kids, that we didn't get the kids who wanted to be engineers. We got the kids who weren't identifying yet. So the results look like a success. As you can see by looking at that, we had 42 girls in that first event. They just loved it. You know, a whole bunch of them said that they were going to study engineering after seeing us. And remember, these were kids who were not going to be interested in engineering. And 12 seniors that were participating said, oh yeah, we're coming to Penn State next year. So in the end, it failed, if you looked at it. So we had a success I could have presented to my dean at that time and just said, hey, this is a great camp, let's keep going. But we tracked those people. We found that only two of the seniors in that first year applied to Penn State, and actually only one of them got in. So really, the camp was very expensive. This was $1,400 per girl that we were doing. And the time analysis, we went and did a time analysis on it because really I was motivated by the fact that I really never wanted to do an overnight camp again in my life. And <laughs> so I thought, let's check this out because sleeping takes up a lot of time. So we only 26% of the time at this camp was really about engineering. So it failed on a lot of different points. What we did is we went to do a change. So we moved from the overnight camp. We decided how can we achieve some of these goals, and we went to having day camp modules. And a, a young woman could come on one day, two days, three days, or five days, and they could pay that way, and they had a different activity every day. So it was nicely structured, but it was based upon the data that we got back. Do you want to pick up? Oh, no, we're not done. <laughs> Okay, so the results were we came up with a better assessment model. We realized that the surveys that we had used did not answer the right questions, so we changed those. We also found out in the end that it serves more women. We're now up to a, a maximum of 300, 300 plus. It serves no maximum. It's endlessly scalable. 
Um, the pre-time was 26. We went up to 90% of the time in engineering, and we did that by things like having lunch, where we'd talk at, have role models talk, or when they were on the bus going to the tour, we talked about what they'd see, what they should ask questions about. We increased the efficiency, so now it's $142, $142 per day to, as compared to $1.4. And then we avoided areas of non-expertise, so no more slumber parties. <laughs> so if you look at the, uh, these results and the time of the residential camp uh, versus the time of the day camp, you, go, you can really see that tiny percentage in the residential camp versus 90% of your time really being focused on what we're about, which is effective outreach. So what were the lessons learned? Oops. Lessons learned were um, really if if your idea of of this camp the having fun is okay I mean you want the kids to have fun but if that it isn't really a metric unless that's your only objective or goal and so too many times we'll hear reports that say it was a great camp the kids were so lively they were having such a great time they were really new I tell you what. We had a camp on aerospace engineering, and afterwards we asked them what do aerospace engineers do. They did not know, but they had fun. So then you go back and you emphasize, now you're doing what aerospace engineers do. Also, poor data or only half the data can lead to wrong overall evaluation and decision making. So we could have gone on and, and not only offered that camp, reported about it, have other people copy it. Surveys don't, that don't ask the right questions yield the wrong answers. So if you're asking questions about, I mean, a good example is, did you like the food? You're not going to change the food, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> so why have that on an, an evaluation? Did you have fun? Why have that? Um, and then adding additional data through post-assessment really can. So if you're not really sure you know what happened, a couple of phone calls that are structured interviews, Looking at uh, time analysis or cost analysis really can help you reshape an activity. And these things are too not often done. Okay. So what are the challenges to actually having effective outreach? Why, why don't we have, apply some of this? And all of us as engineers in the room would not approach an, an engineering problem this way. We, we would st sit back and say, you know, what are the relevant technologies we can use to attack this problem? What do our customers need? What are our constraints? Uh, what, are the, what are the goals of the products? Uh, and we would build all of this. A company simply would not do, we would never do in our jobs, and I would argue in a, in a good association, we would never run our associations this way. But it's actually what we fail to do in engineering outreach. Okay. Oh, the second one. So, I think one of the biggest problems that I've seen when we're talking with people in engineering societies or people in general offering outreach camps is they fail to address the audience that they've selected. So the audience really should be the kids taking the camp. But too often it becomes, because you have volunteers, you're asking them to spend their time and bring their ex expertise in, the audience becomes, uh, the, be, the default audience becomes the volunteers themselves. So are the volunteers happy? Are we going to make Joe unhappy because we're not offering his camp for the 10th year in a row? Are we, you know, all of these things happen. So-and-so is so invested in this camp, we really, even though we know it's not working, we really have to keep doing it because she's going to be unhappy. So the audience is just a really, really important thing. And, and getting past this whole idea of if you do, do something good, you're offering an activity for kids, it looks good and it makes everybody feel good. These are not really good criteria for whether a camp is worth, or whether an outreach activity, I'm sorry, I keep defaulting to camp, outreach activity is a good thing to do or not. And then I think another thing is, and this is particularly true when you're talking about collaborations, I've been in a lot of collaborations with a lot of other universities and a lot of other societies, and the key thing is if you haven't, de if you haven't defined the value added for every partner, if people haven't really seen what role they're going to take and have ownership for that role, that collaboration is never going to work. But that's also true when you're trying to bring faculty together, when you're trying to bring society members together to offer an outreach activity. If they don't have this common idea of what the value added is, what the goals and objectives are, 
it's it's not going to be as good as it could be. And and finally, I think uh, one of the messages that came out of the survey results that we saw is very often our own society members aren't aware of the very programs that we're trying to say are so important to us. So if we say uh, outreach to underrepresented uh, students is very important, why are we not putting the resources, the financial, the people, the leadership resources behind it? We saw in the, the, the uh, data that were collected in advance from all of you that a lot of people were saying people don't really know what's happening in outreach in our societies. That's kind of crazy when this is a big focus of societies today is try to attract more students into engineering. So then the question is, is how can it be that your society memberships don't know this? And of course, you also have the limitation, you know, always have the limitation of human and financial resources. And we, you know, we'll talk a little more about that, but at the same time, I think that just argues all the more how important it is that you take the resources that you do have and make them effective. So now we're just going to move on, and we're really rushing through this. So if anyone has any questions later, we'll, we'll give you our email addresses. We're happy to talk with folks. But um, we see the assessment-based base framework. This is the thing that really can respond to all of these challenges and uh, basically Again, we want to equate that to what engineers always do anyway. It's just somehow it's not gotten translated to outreach practice. Okay. Well, as someone who grew up as a volunteer in uh, an engineering society, let me tell you what the typical approach is, because I'm embarrassed to say how many times that uh, my local uh, section did this. We agreed to do something. We pick uh, a program based on, hey, I, I know a, I'm an electrical engineer. I think this is fun and interesting. I got my friends to, to help implement it. And I afterwards say, did we have success? Well, we had you know, 40 girls show up and everybody seemed to have a good time. So we're going to offer it again with the same materials I, as an engineer, How developed. many of you are aware of this model? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. New, new so model. we have another model for you. We are not going to go through it step by step. Well, we are, but we're not going to do it on this slide. But it's a it's a way to really kind of challenge that model and change it. So the first thing is having the idea of having a broad inspirational goal, aspirational goal, and this also should be an overarching goal. And Betty and I talked about the fact that you could say goals because if you're talking about a collaboration, part of the collaboration is bringing people together, and that isn't a goal. That's the function, that's structure, that's process. So having a well-defined goal starting out um, is just a really critical thing. And so here's the goal. We want uh, participants to become engineers. So that's, that's your overall goal. And it could be much more grandiose or much less, but that's the goal. Okay. And so then the next thing you do is identify the objectives. And these really are the things where you say what you want to have happen at the camp or at the uh, outreach activity and how you are going to measure it. So don't write an objective unless you can say this is how I measure it. So here we say um, you're going to introduce girls to engineering through design and fabrication of a structure. So participants will learn the use of creative design and engineering. You can write questions. Or you can do a test. You can do all sorts of things to test, did we succeed? Did we do that? The other one is about explaining engineering to society. Ask them to explain how engineers contribute to society. So we're not just assuming that this is implicit, that they're getting this implicitly. And we're going to talk more about with volunteers. You share this with volunteers so they know that these kids are going to be tested on whether they can articulate what you think you're role modeling. So it creates a foundation for planning assessment and continuous improvement. And it also describes exactly what the um, objectives will achieve rather than describes an activity. So you all know about the objective saying we will, so an objective is, is we will have some kids experience, um, experience engineering design. So the only possible question for that is, did you experience engineering design? Yes or no. But if you say they will learn through, if they will learn the specific things through engineering design, then you have something you can get a metric on and an outcome. And finally, these objectives must be measurable. 
So let's talk about leveraging the objectives and, and resources to, to define what initiatives you're actually going to going to pull together. So how much does research inform the, the, uh, the choice of what you're going to do? Uh, as an engineer, I think, and, and as moving into the, some of my roles in the Society of Engineers, I was amazed at how much research that's out there that is written by social scientists for other social scientists but it's directly applicable to all of us as practitioners. So let's uh, leverage the research, and we'll give you some guidelines to, to guides to research that will actually inform the choice of what's a good initiative to put together. And a good example of that is if you hear all the time that we need to attract more girls into um, engineering and they're not taking math, so they need to do that. Well, if you look at the data, there are more girls taking higher level math than boys. So this should inform what you do in these camps. So if you know these kids have the math skills, then you're not talking to them anymore about being sure to take math. You're talking to them about how would you use this math as an engineer? Why is this important to do? So, I mean, the research can, that's data, but there's research that can tell you a lot of these things. And then design your initiative based on the goal and objectives, not the other way around. Too often is, I have a great program, and then I make up a goal and objective. And finally, look at what, what each other have done. And the beauty of this room here is now the opportunity to start sharing what each other has done and um, build on what has been effective as opposed to recreating yet another initiative. So uh, in terms of where is this research? Well, to a large extent, this is, this is technology transfer. This is taking the social sciences, the behavioral studies, the, uh, the demographic information, and turning it into practice that we can get our optimal results. Uh, in terms of research, whole litany of uh, resources that are out there. I think what I particularly want to highlight something that's been new in the last couple of years is the wealth of TED Talks. That is something I think is very valuable for getting out to your volunteers. 15-minute video. You don't have to read a long paper, and you get the essence of a lot of the research. I used to try to explain to people what Carol Dreck's work was on fixing growth mindset. How many of you are aware of that? If you're not aware of it, Get on the TED Talk and listen. I used to try to explain it, or I used to give them books to read, and now I say, go to the TED Talk, <laughs> because this is distilled, and it's really good, and, and it's D-W-E-C-K, but there's a lot of really good stuff. Stereotype threat, if you want to know about that, go to a TED Talk, and it really is a good way, and this is such an important thing to know if you're offering um, any kind of outreach for underrepresented students. And in terms of practice, a uh, number of resources, but hopefully at the end of this workshop, one of the things that will come out that is one of the most valuable re uh, resources going forward will be the work that this group does together. And this is not in any way meant to be an exhaustive or even a, a good hierarchy of resources. It's, it's an example. Okay. So metrics. Okay, so we talked a little bit about metrics, and I think we all understand that. But I think using those objectives, to understand what questions to ask so that you understand what you want your outcomes to be in objective terms. Not they had fun, but they know now what a civil engineer does. Or they know, and they do get to have fun, Amy. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's always, that was always a question. Of course they have to have fun, but this is not our objective. Our objective is to make them aware of engineering or teach them how to do things. And so that your metrics really come to that. And so, Examples of that, you know, where do they work? Where you, the, the questions you ask should really tell you whether they're learning the things that you think you want them to learn during this event. So the measure uh, participation in demographics. I think one of the things that we found in a lot of the surveying we've done, and I think that you found the same thing with the survey that you all did it beforehand, is that people will have these events. They'll say, we want to attract more underrepresented students to engineering. And do they have the data afterwards to even show who came to that event? Does the society have the data to say who, who, um, who came, how many were girls, how many were African American, how many were Hispanic? And those things are critical if part of what we're trying to do is, is bring more unrepresented people into engineering. And you get what you measure. 
And at the Society of Women Engineers, we added demographics to the measurement and an expectation. So what was supposed to reach underrepresented girls all of a sudden started reaching underrepresented girls when they had the one it was part of what was being reported. Once once you're held accountable, then you go to that school that has a lot of these girls in them, and you make sure those kids not only get there, but you can pay for the bus and you make sure that there are ways to bring them there. Oh, did we miss resources? Yeah. Did I jump ahead? Oh, we're missing one. How did that happen? Well, let's, we're going to talk through it then because it's yeah. important. Okay, a really important. Oh, there, oh, there it is. Word and resources. So one of the things, again, we saw in reading your responses to things coming in ahead of time was that how do you pay for assessment? And I think the fact that when you do an NSF grant, and they're expecting you to pay a percentage of your grant on um, assessment, it, it, it makes you think that it's too expensive to do. And of course, what they're talking about is an overall assessment of a very expensive program as opposed to assessment of outreach activities. And I, it's affordable. I think if it's integrated from the beginning, then you begin to consider it as part of the activity. If you schedule time to take the, take the uh, survey, if you schedule time to do the um, data analysis and to report it, all of those things become a natural part of what you're doing. Also, if you find the volunteer for whom spreadsheets are heaven, and I was always that person, then you can get that person into doing the assessment work, which is the data collection and analysis. And if that's not possible, make it part of the responsibility of the educational arm of your society so that it gets done. And then make sure those data come back to one central place so you don't have them scattered all over it. That's really hard to do. Um, I think the other thing, the most important thing, is you can use off-the-shelf resources. Um, we, with uh, online, which has a number of resources online, and they're a little bit dated now, but they are, are pre and post at all different levels. They are also pre and post for volunteers, for observations. All of those, all those materials are there for free download. So we went through and looked at what were the best survey tools at that time. And SurveyMonkey is the one we came up with. Now we're committed to it because we have all our data there. But this tool actually allows you to go through, through and do fairly sophisticated analysis of the data with a push of the button, literally a push of the button. So it doesn't have to be you're bringing in someone who's skilled in data analysis. They're doing it for you. So looking at that, looking at what you can find that's free and available. And then um, create a bank of common surveys and tools. Yeah. So finally, the, the last point is this may be a little more expensive. You may have to invest some time, but let me tell you what is very expensive, putting on an initiative that does not work. So let's see, where are we? So we jumped over there, the so we data jump, plan. Yep, yep, we, there we go. There we go. So, uh, Oh, okay, so we're, we're not going to spend any time on this at all. I think that these slides will be available to you because we know how short the time is. I think the thing that we really wanted to uh, emphasize again is the value added, that understanding what the value is for doing this for collaborations as well as for engineering outreach, that, that it really is important in, in all of this to use it to erase obstacles to sharing information. If people can agree on some common instruments, if they can agree on common ideas about how outreach is done, then, then it becomes easier to share. So you're no longer apples and oranges, you're looking at bananas to bananas. And then it, it also allows you to compare initiatives across platforms. So you have some groups here who really do a very, very good job of bringing in um, uh, very, uh, interdisciplinary groups are very, what am I trying to say, very diverse groups, look at the methodologies and see how they work in different things. There's a lot of information that can be gotten here. And that if you do that with like any collaboration you come up with, these are things that then can be expanded beyond those collaborations. Finally, implement and measure the initiative. We've already gone through this. So after you've implemented it, make sure you take the time to measure it. That includes the the most important thing is when you're working out that schedule, put in a half an hour for them to take surveys. Again, if you use something like SurveyMonkey, you can, do, you can collect your data in advance, the pre-data they can do at home. 
you can easily do a post data and a far post data, six month data, if you have all their email addresses. And well, who who doesn't like to sit down and take a rewarding survey? Many people, but <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and then make sure we use the data. I think that's yeah. the next one. Yeah. Yep. Oh, and again, we're back to the volunteers. If the volunteers are not aware, if you just bring them in, if they don't know what your objectives are, if they don't know what they're being measured on, you're not going to be able to get the right information out. So your volunteers, your staff, really all have to be on board with the same set of objectives and the same idea of outcomes. What's, what's crucial to this initiative's success? Uh, success? It's really the recruitment, selecting, and training the volunteers. So repeating what Barbara just said, make sure every volunteer knows why we are doing this and understands the approach that we're going through. So you want to provide them the training that they need uh, to go in and say, how do you interact with the participants? What's the message we're trying to get across? Uh, not just say, we're going to do this, but how are we going to do this so they're, that they're prepared? Um, and also, break down your programs, your initiative, so that no one role is too big. Uh, so often I think it's, you know, a group of people all do the whole thing. And I th first of all, that limits your recruiting. If I can't commit to uh, a horrendous amount of time, I can't participate. You know, I think sometimes our goal was that that does not kill them makes them stronger. And it's really saying, you know, can I do something for a couple hours and contribute? So break it down so that there are different levels. And if you have someone who really is an extremely good presenter, bring that person in for an hour to present to the kids and don't, don't make them be there for an entire day. So that way you can get a much broader group of people and you can tailor individual skills to the roles that you're asking them to play. You know, dist distribute your leadership amongst uh, a group of uh, leaders. It also gives you the ability to have a backup if you, if you lose somebody. And avoids that intensive load that on a, you know, a single person who then is uh, you know, just feeling the pressure when work gets busy. Um, also, to kind of continue about you know, someone's a good presenter, well, not everyone's good at interacting with children. And not everyone is who the children want to see. Uh, you know, I, I, I attended one session where a corporate executive I thought was amazing was there. But to a bunch of seventh graders, they had no idea what she did. But when the young engineers came in and were talking exactly about what they're doing, they were in their glory. So make roles appropriate to where, where people are in their careers and where their skills are. This is also a response to what I heard before, which is, you know, how do we get younger people involved? And I, I see them when they graduate, and I can tell you, they want to be involved. So if they, and, but they're going into new jobs. They can't take, or they shouldn't take on a big role. Some of them are ready to do it. You can't let them do that. But you can say, hey, come for the 5 o'clock coffee hour, or please come and just run this one thing, and everyone else will get the materials together, We'll work on it for you. You just plug in as a leader and the obvious role model there. And it's a good way to do it. And I think we also have to be very, you know, we have to be able to say to people, let's get the, it's a good way to say to people, let's get some of these younger people in here to do that. That is not to say that every young person is going to be a good, good person in front of kids or that every old person is going to be, is not going to be good. But it's really understanding that some people are more effective in front of children or teenagers than others. And finally, volunteers are not the primary audience. We're not doing this for our volunteers. So talking about uh, actually analyzing and using the data, you know, so often the event is over, it's like, okay, let's go out to dinner, have a glass of wine, and we'll put it in a box, and we'll pull it out next year. Got to schedule the time and fund the analysis and the, you know collect the data at a society level. Uh, make sure the time is at the local level for uh, pulling the, the data together and do do your analysis. And like Barbara said, things like SurveyMonkey uh, will help make those cheap, uh, cheaper. But the most important part here then is that arrow back. It's not just what we know; it's what we do with what we know. Use the results to say this was, this went well. This didn't go well. How do we change? How do we improve? How do we enhance? 
and invest in making those changes. And then finally, I think this is another thing that people fail to do way too often is tell the story. To go out and tell other societies what you've done in a detailed way so that they, they understand the different uh, process that you've taken. That you, it helps you recruit uh, participants. It helps you get funding because you told the story and you have all the information on it. It helps you engage your members. So if they see this and realize it's a successful thing and can see them doing some of these activities, and the whole plug-in thing really begins to work very well. And you can also use them to expand your collaborations. Also, the thing that's really important is to do what I've done today, is talk about failure. You know, talk about where it doesn't work, and then what did we do to make it better. And I have to tell you, that story, which I've told probably too many times for everyone, is it helped me get funding because people could see that you were really serious, that you were collecting data, and that you were using the data to improve what you were doing. So there's no downside to this, but, but it's a thing, again, you know, we're, we're done with the activity, we're, we're done, and, and writing that last report and getting it out to the membership so they know what's going on is a really hard thing to do. But that, that is a really critical thing to do. So finally, if we have three things to take away, from this, one is that apply good engineering practice to achieve good engineering outcomes. Second is the volunteers are not your primary audience. And finally, it's more expensive to offer initiatives that do not work than it is to take the time and preparation to make sure they do work. Think of the money that we put into these, the, the person hours, all of these things that we do to make these activities work. If they're not functional, that's down the drain. So oh, that's it. Here's, here's our contact information. And we didn't get in the way of lunch. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, about five minutes for questions, comments. So you uh, you asked a question about. Oh, I need to go to the mic. I can just hand this to you. Yeah. And if you have questions, line up the mic because that'll just keep us going. So you, you made a comment about uh, how different forms of outreach aren't uh, accomplished because, uh, or, or the engagement issue uh, that relates to individuals uh, uh, either succeeding or not succeeding in an outcome. And I'm, and I'm not phrasing this question uh, to totally properly. Um, let me let somebody else go and I'll... Oh, okay, okay. I don't, want, I don't want to screw it up. Okay. <laughs> He'll rephrase it. Um, I did like the comment about uh, evaluate and um, getting the survey and make sure you're measuring the right things. I've, and it made me think of, uh, I know AIA does a workforce survey. When you're doing your evaluation, do you at all do like a year over year to try and see if someone had participated say two or three years ago, did they continue to evaluate or continue to participate or do you, if not, do you track them in any way, shape or form? That's, that's the gold standard. There's no question that that's the gold standard. And uh, Carl, his SEEK program does this more effectively than anyone I know because it is, it is an effort. But the internet makes it easier and that's longitudinal data. And that's extremely valuable to have because it also tells you when maybe your program is no longer more sophisticated enough, which is a big issue now for the students that are coming in. Or So, yes, we do do that, and we ask people to do that. And I think within a society it would be wonderful to do that and to be able to exchange that information. But the best possible thing you can do is track that person. If they come back, you know, see if it impacts them more, having been there one or two times. Oh, there are all sorts of things around that, but yes, that's the, that's the gold standard. It's also the gold standard because it's all hard to reach. <laughs> and especially when you start looking at one program leading to another program, too, there's uh, probably some paths that are optimal and some that are less optimal. And if that, with the, you know, that gold standard or that holy grail out there, if societies can start to uh, share information, then you can say, oh, if somebody uh, participated in FIRST Robotics, Here's the next good. Uh, here's a good next step, as opposed to they haven't 
p- participate in something like this? What's the first step? And well, I know what NSBE is, as an example has been able to do with their um, with that kind of tracking and with that kind of data is they're now scaling it across the country and serving tens of thousands of kids but because they have the data is what allows that. A companion point is illustrated by this talk is that in many cases a tag team approach can be very effective. And I find particularly <laughs> particularly in outreach activities where you can mix the things up. You talked about having people that were more age appropriate. Depending on the group, if you're talking to elementary school kids, having a high school student and a parent who are both in tune helps. If you're talking to more college or high school level kids, sometimes having a senior and a junior person is much more effective because they see in the real world uh, age doesn't necessarily matter so much that you have to work together. As that's, that's a really important point, and you always have to go gingerly around that idea that because my, my husband's a case in point. He, he does mechanical engineering things, and, and he's old. <laughs> and as my kids say, he's a kid magnet. He comes in there, and they all want to talk to him and work. So you, you just have to look at who, who works you know, and who doesn't, and then really have some frank discussions about that you know, and try and get people to hone in on what are our objectives here. They're not, they're not to make the volunteers happy, although we want to do that too. <laughs> Get ready. One more time here. So you started off talking about a program you did that failed, right, or yes, did not yeah. work as well. And then you went back and you developed the protocol that you're using now. If you had to put your hands on one or two things that would make that, that made that one entity fail and then the subsequent one succeed, what, 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 what would those be? Well, I have to say, first of all, that camp is what got me into assessment. <laughs> that was my entry. That was my entry drug, actually. And so um, I think that the main thing is just following those steps. What is your goal? What are your objectives? How am I going to measure them? What am I going to do with the measurement? What changes am I going to make? And so it is all one piece. But once you've done the one thing, and the, so the objective is probably the most important thing, but serving the goal means they're coherent as opposed to random. So it just, but it becomes, it becomes a habit. You just don't go into anything without just beginning to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm involved in a lot of community activities now, and I just make everyone mad when I say, okay, what's her, what are our objectives here? And they go, wow. <laughs> you know? So you just get used to it. Does that answer your question? And I, I think there's also an additional piece, too, of, uh, if you're going to do an outreach program, there are people who are experts at developing outreach materials. So starting to build the program from someone who has expertise in that as opposed to someone who has expertise in electrical engineering. So, uh, you know, I think if you start to look at some of these uh, initiatives and you're saying, this is what I'm trying to accomplish, who is an education expert? Who is an ex- expert working with children? Uh, messaging. And the more we leverage these you know, expert-done programs, I think the better we put our volunteers' time, invest their, their time in what they're good at, being a role model, uh, being excited about engineering, and get them to, away from investing their time in uh, tr- pretending to be educators. And I think another thing here that, that is really important to keep in mind is everybody wants to do a new thing. You know, we, we compare that to, to uh, transportation. Everyone wants to build the new link out to Dulles Airport. Nobody wants to maintain the cars. And if you live or have used the metro, you can see that that doesn't get us anywhere. So really being willing to pick up other people's ideas and change them, you know, to figure out, walk backwards. What were their objectives? What were they doing? Did these meet mine? And But, you know, there may be a very good idea that you want to repurpose, change. And so resisting... Doing something over again, I think, is a big problem. Hi. I'm, I, I, in addition to being a mechanical engineering faculty member at the Naval Academy, I'm also the STEM director for education and outreach. Great. And our programs are funded by Office of Naval Research and Office of Secretary of Defense and considered best practices for um, for uh, educational outreach in STEM areas. 
We predominantly because of the fact that we have imposed assessment on all of our programs. To collect that data, we, however, have to go through human subject protocols. Mm -hmm. So I just was wondering if you would comment a little bit on uh, what some of the caveats are to collecting assessment data. If you're in a university and it's a university program, it has to go through um, human subjects. And that, that is something that if you're partnering with the university or partnering with your human subjects, um, whatever that entity is, it does not have to be onerous. And it really, it's a good thing. I mean, it's an annoying thing, but it's a good thing. And so you have to do that. Now, with the uh, engineering societies, that would be up to the policies of your societies. Um, certainly having um, kids sign off on you being able to use their data as a minimum is really important guaranteeing anonymity. So being aware that, that you really can't just use things because you offered the program is a good thing. But um, So I don't know what your parameters are within the societies, but if you're working with the university, you are going to have to do that. Hi, Virginia from uh, Namipa. Uh, I have a question around the assessment piece, what if what you're assessing isn't the problem in terms of how a program works or doesn't work? How do you capture the intrinsic pieces? If it's something, I deal with underrepresented populations, sometimes the students don't feel welcome or included. And so the outcome of an assessment may not be about what you did. It could be about how the student felt. And I don't know how to capture that, so I just I didn't know if you had familiarity with identifying what went wrong. We have examples of that in the all products, and that is very much something you can ask about. <coughs> and and you can ask about whether they were comfortable. You can find out about, um, and I, I I'd have trouble going through the scales right now, but that's out there, and it's it in yeah. But, yeah, very much, and that is an important thing to measure, especially if you have a mixed group. You know, so you can look out and see everyone having a great time, and then you find out in your data later that, that there were kids that absolutely felt marginalized. And so, again, you take, you take that outcome and you say, okay, we need to fix that. And almost always you fix it by being more aware of the problem. So if you see, then you start to see it happening. So like if the boys grab all the tools and the girls stand back as an obvious example, <coughs> you start to notice it once you've assessed it. And that I think certainly a part of that your volunteers have to be aware of, of in their training, especially if they're not from the population that you're, you're reaching. So uh, they have to become very uh, aware of their biases, their, their actions, the, the, the things they will do that will just enhance that marginalization as opposed to uh, enhance the experience of feeling included for the students. And I would say sometimes like if you're serving a wholly African-American group, you can have in your mind, well, there's no problems here. Well, you still have boys and girls, <laughs> so you still have something that you have to pay attention to. You may still have urban and rural. You may, so you really have to be aware of those things. People have to be trained to address them, and then if you've addressed them in your assessment, you'll know what to be, how to behave better next time. So, thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me not walk off of here. You're going to keep the microphone.